Okay, this video is called What Thickens the Blood? And it's sort of like a dietary treatment options with congestive heart failure. And it relates to cardiac angina as well, coronary artery atherosclerosis. Um, so this, where this comes from is if you were asking me a question about it, it got me thinking about it a little more. So basically, first of all, disclaimer, if you're on pills, let your doctor know before you change your diet because this diet will change your medication dosages likely. You'll need less medicines most likely. Okay, um, many patients, you know, can have heart problems also from atrial fibrillation. Thick blood makes your heart have to work harder. It's harder to pump thick blood that's like a milkshake than normal thin blood that's like water. Okay, so what thickens the blood? Saturated fat will thicken the blood, as well as all the other fats except to some extent. Omega-3s are a little bit different, but basically fats are all bad. I'll explain why even omega-3s are bad in a moment, but saturated fats are perhaps the worst. Omega fill, well, actually people would argue omega-6 fats, based on the Meyer Friedman and uh, Ray Rosenman studies, they would cause even more prolonged blood sludging than saturated fat, making the red blood cells stick together. And they can call that low formation. You can call that um, blood sludge. Dr. McDougall has a good website at his, his YouTube channel where he did work with uh, Roy Swank, and they showed the the fat meal causing the blood cells to stick together, red blood cells. Okay, LDL cholesterol is also a bridging molecule. It causes red blood cells to stick together. LDL cholesterol is caused by eating a high-fat diet, by eating meat with all its saturated fat, but also eating protein powers. T. Colin Campbell has shown that when you, you eat excessive amounts of protein, especially animal protein, your cholesterol goes up. I think it, in a sense, induces an anabolic phase into the body and it tends to activate mTOR, accelerating the rate at which cells divide. And when cells are dividing, they need to make a copy of themselves. They have to double themselves before they can divide. So they need more synthetic materials. They, they raise cholesterol in the blood to make it more available for the cells to divide, to speed up the rate of growth. Um, it's a building block. All um, animal cells stabilize their plasma membranes with cholesterol. Okay, what else? Um, uric acid elevation can also stick red blood cells together. Uric acid is a bridging molecule. So that would include from eating meat, high fructose corn syrup, for example. Um, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a clotting protein and um, it's elevated by psychological stress. Um, caffeine does the same thing, elevates the same hormones, cortisol and catecholamine. So it will elevate fibrinogen. Sleep deprivation is a stress equivalent. That'll do it. Corticosteroid medications will do it. Um, inflammation will do it because fibrinogen is, an, and it's, they're called acute phase reactants. These are proteins made in the liver that are released in response to stress, but they're also released in response to inflammation. Um, they thicken the blood. They make it more prone to clotting. Okay. Also, anything that causes leaky gut is bad because things that cause leaky gut, they will allow some bacterial endotoxin, like gram-negative bacteria, LPS, lipopolysaccharide. By the way, I've made videos about all this stuff individually, so if you want to get more information about these subjects on an individual basis, you can do it. This here is just a summary of how it all relates to congestive heart failure. Um, in addition, that postprandial endotoxemia from eating meat, because the bacterial endotoxins can get across the gut lining, because when you don't eat the dietary fiber that comes from plant foods, you have a tendency to have increased intestinal permeability. That's called leaky gut. So those things will cause inflammation. But the relevance here to it becoming thickening the blood is that endotoxins are prothrombotic. And it's not just gram-negative bacteria with LPS, lipopolysaccharide. It's also gram-positive bacteria with uh, LTA, lipotychoic acid. They do about the same thing. And I gave lectures previously like about amyloidosis whereby they predispose the blood to clotting, okay? Um, they deform the shape of red blood cells, make them less able to carry oxygen, okay? Um, what else? Uh, F minus in the water, that'll increase your risk of leaky gut. Antibiotics will kill off a lot of good bacteria, increase your leak, risk of leaky gut. Glyphosate increases your leaky gut. I made a whole autoimmune checklist of things that increase the risk of leaky gut. Another possible thickener of the blood is excessive uh, calcium intake. When those dosages get up high, they, it's thought to cause a transient uh, prothrombotic phase in the blood. Uh, it's just transient, you know, as the calcium then gets stored away, but I think it's a bad idea. That it was like a 2.57 times increased all-cause mortality in women who were taking over uh, 1,400 milligrams a day of calcium. Not a good idea. Okay, what stiffens red blood cells? Advanced glycation end products, AGEs. Where do AGEs come from? 
AGEs come from insulin resistance, which means eating a high fat diet, you know, and even omega threes will cause insulin resistance. They'll also cause obesity and obesity secondarily will lead, has a tendency to lead to hypertension, which causes atherosclerosis. It has a tendency to lead to um, insulin resistance and increase the risk of diabetes. Uh, fried foods are terrible. They'll give you a lot of advanced glycation end products. Um, other things that cause, anything that causes insulin resistance, predisposing to type two diabetes. Uh, big foods also release increase AGEs a little bit, so you get it from plant foods too, especially if, if you fry them and they're high fat to begin with. What else causes insulin resistance? Well, we talk about it. All fats do. That's why all dietary fats, in my opinion, are bad. And it's not just my opinion. That's pretty much you'll get that type of opinion coming out of uh, Pritikin and McDougal. Um, Esselstyn is a little bit light, I think, on flax, and I don't want to get into that right now. But other than that, he's pretty tight against minimizing fats. He doesn't even allow his patients to eat nuts. Okay, what else? Excessive dietary sodium. Sodium causes problems. In addition to having a negative effect, uh, bad effect on insulin resistance, it also causes platelet activation, which predisposes to clotting, which thickens the blood. Not good. Um, and the excess chloride will displace bicarbonate because you have to balance the number of anions, negative charged ions in the blood such that you'll get a low-grade metabolic acidosis and that has negative consequences as well. Being sedentary, sitting on your butt all day, not good because exercising has a similar effect to insulin sensitivity. It gets the glucose type 4 transporters in the skeletal muscle cells, for example, to move from their cytoplasm storage vesicles up to the plasma membrane to then merge with the plasma membrane and open up and they're like um, glucose channels. They allow glucose into the cell. So they lower insulin resistance. When you exercise, you get a, that makes you more insulin sensitive. It's a very good thing. Okay, alcohol causes fatty liver, increases diabetes. Um, eventually, it damages the pancreas as well as another mechanism by which it'll predispose to diabetes. High fructose corn syrup, fatty liver, predisposing to diabetes. Excessive iron and excessive copper uh, can also have toxic effects and contribute to lipid peroxidation. Um, and uh, pancreatic damage. Let's see, what else? A lack of magnesium and potassium because there's very little in animal foods. You get those from plant foods. So these are all things that can contribute to insulin resistance. Most important, though, is excessive dietary fat. Okay, what weakens the heart muscle pumping power? Well, you need tons of energy to, to maintain muscular uh, power. Okay, so what does that? Things that inhibit mitochondria. We talked about lead, PB. We talked about mercury, HG, saturated fat, fluor. Uh, we talked about hydroxynanol, that's from omega-6 cooking oils, that's a, a, a toxic aldehyde that's a byproduct of the metabolism of omega-6 cooking oils. And that sort of relates back to all the work of Tetsumori Yamashima, the Japanese neuroscientist who was figuring out why are so many Japanese people becoming demented because uh, they're eating more cooking oils was a big, what he thought was the main reason. Okay, cadmium, that's on a lot of non-organic food to a higher degree than organic food. Trichloroethylene, like from dry cleaning and cleaning chemicals. Paraquat is sort of a, a herbicide pesticide thing and rotenone as well. Um, let's see, what else? But, you know, sat fat is the main most common thing people are exposed to that's damaging to mitochondria. There's also a group of uh, elements that will decrease energy production from cells called circa inhibitors. And that's sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. And that relates to the endoplasmic reticulum being a storage site in the blood for calcium. So things that inhibit this enzyme are things like hyperglycemia, which is diabetes, uh, F minus water, HG, aluminum. Aluminum is sort of a toxic substance that we get exposed to more than we should. Um, red number three, the, the dye, uh, glyphosate, you know, the herbicide. Um, BHA and BHT are preservatives in a lot of processed food. Oxybenzones and sunscreens. This is meant to be cadmium. Okay, flame retardants. You know, for example, I'll wear just a plain, you know, clean uh, white or yellow gown for doing a minor procedure rather than put on the blue uh, surgeon operating gowns because they got flame retardants in them because they're, the assumption is that they might be working with cautery. Uh, so why expose myself to a flame retardant if I don't need to? So that's one way I avoid them. And you got there's a lot of ways to avoid these, like aluminum. Avoid it by don't use deodorant and don't eat off aluminum cookware and don't let anybody put your food in aluminum, okay? And don't drink out of cans. Um, what else? Uh, paints, glues, bleach. In general, anything that smells bad is bad for you and might be a circa inhibitor. Um, alcohol, uh, MJ. You know what MJ is? Uh, the green. Okay, so BPA, uh, atrazine. Especially, I know atrazine is a mitochondrial toxin, but BPA is also thought to be a circa inhibitor. PCBs. 
Okay, some medications like beta blockers, of course, will decrease cardiac pumping power. Oxidative stress can also lead to a decrease in cardiac pumping power. And you get oxidative stress if you have ex excess amounts of transitional metals. Transitional metals have variable valence, most commonly iron, but it can also be copper. Um, you're like, you got to be careful about taking a multivitamin. Sometimes they'll have stuff in there that you don't want, and you can accumulate toxic amounts of it. Um, omega-6 oils are especially prone to lipid peroxidation, but I would be concerned, too, about omega-3s. Uh, lack of antioxidants. You get antioxidants from meat and plants, so that's what you want. Plants, you get the good stuff. Meat and processed food, you get the bad stuff. What foods constrict arteries? Well, caffeine and sodium are both vasoconstrictors. So a lot of people, they eat processed food with tons of sodium in it, and they drink coffee or tea or some other form of caffeine. So it's a bad combination. You're causing vasoconstriction, um, and simultaneously, you know, the caffeine has more of a, a cardiac effect. Sodium inhibits endothelial nitric oxide as part of its um, uh, harmful effect. Okay, now, are there any case reports on the reversal of congestive heart failure? Yes, there's at least two by Robert Osfeld. He's a smart cardiologist who also has uh, done a lot of study of nutrition. Okay, now here's some comedy. If you go to famous hospitals and you see what they say about nutrition for congestive heart failure patients and coronary artery disease patients, you will laugh your head off. It's so stupid. It's the opposite of the truth. Cleveland Clinic brags that it's one of the best heart hospitals, you know, cardiac care hospitals in the world. And look what they tell their congestive heart failure patients to eat. Fresh beef, completely stupid, freaking retarded. If I was teaching nutrition, I would flunk the student for writing that. Pork, you know, is that insane? Fish, Fish is like one of those things, pseudoscience, people say it's good. It's a terrible food, okay? Look at salmon, 50% fat, 50% animal protein. It's a terrible food, full of toxic chemicals. Then they say egg whites, dairy, milk, yogurt, low-sodium cheese. This is all idiotic. Olive oil, nuts. And you say, well, I'll go to one of the other ones. I got news for you. I went to some of the other ones. They were just as stupid. The most famous hospitals in America. And when it comes to nutrition, they suck. They stink. They're a bunch of liars. I told you, I showed you the Harvard Willett food pyramid. It's a total lie. It's dishonest. It causes coronary artery disease. It makes patients worse off, okay? And then people say, well, how do I know you're telling the truth? Why should I trust you over some famous place? I'll tell you why. Because you have a brain in your head. Look at epidemiology. A billion out of a billion rice-eating Asians. They're all skinny. And you look at other plant-based populations. They're skinny and healthy with no high blood pressure. High blood pressure is the main risk factor for atherosclerosis. Look at the Tadahumata in northern Mexico, uh, Copper Canyon, okay? Look at the Yanomamo in uh, the Amazon jungle, you know, by Venezuela and Brazil. And one after another, you get the same thing. Same thing with Papua New Guinea. Same thing with the Japanese migration studies. Same thing with the Okinawans. It'll be the same thing with any population you study. When they ate old-fashioned plant-based diets, look at the Kenyans, you know, black in America got hypertension off the charts. When you go to Kenya, 1929, uh, the Lancet, uh, the Donison paper, 1,800 consecutive hospital admissions in a row, not a single patient with hypertension. So it's overwhelming how conclusive the epidemiologic information is. Look at uh, the work of uh, Kempner and Burkett and Ornish and Esselstyn, etc. So it's pretty obvious that that is the truth and it is correct. So it just shows you, you know, the old joke was, these foundations, like for heart disease, recommend a diet that causes heart disease. For diabetes, that causes diabetes. Uh, so anyways, uh, I thought that was interesting. And so there's just the logic of it. Basically, what am I saying is if you eat the low-fat, low-sodium, whole food, plant-based diet, you will not have all this fat and you won't have all this sodium. And you'll get all the good stuff, the antioxidants, the magnesium, the potassium from the plants and whatnot. And the blood will be normal like it should be, which is thinner, Okay. So when I say thinner, I'm talking about the thickness of the blood, the viscosity of the blood. I'm not talking about anticoagulation per se. That's a different subject. It's related, but it's a different subject. But what I am saying is by avoiding the fat, the sodium, the caffeine, all this other bad stuff, and all these mitochondria inhibitors that tend to be common in processed food and circuit inhibitors, you're going to give the muscle more strength to pump. It's going to be pumping a thinner fluid, making it easier to pump, uh, kind of makes con common sense, doesn't it? Make sure you talk to your doctor, though, because whatever doses you've previously taken, there's a very good chance you'll need to change them. And you don't want to start the diet before you work with your doctor to change them because you, you might end up with the doses being too high and, and a mismatch there. So anyways, thought that was interesting. Good luck.